First, hope you're all doing well today. Uh, welcome to the first past session of the third cycle. I hope you guys are all excited. Inshallah, you'll learn something new. Uh, so today's lecture is about cellular protein sorting and targeting. Basically, what we're discussing in this lecture is after these proteins are made, they, they basically all have a certain function. So we're going to discuss like how these proteins are going to be moved over to the site where they're going to carry out these functions. Now, before we start, some important organelles that you probably took in foundation, but I'm going to go over them again now uh, because they're important to understand what these organelles are doing before you understand what, how these proteins are going to be localized. Now, the first ones are the ribosomes. The ribosomes are the site of protein synthesis. Once the, once the DNA found in the nucleus is going to be transcribed into an mRNA sequence, it is going to be sent over to the, to the cytoplasm. And in the cytoplasm, we're going to have these ribosomes. Now, ribosomes could either be found freely around the cytoplasm, or they could be attached on the endoplasmic reticulum membrane, on the rough endoplasmic reticulum. And basically, the ribosomes are the site of the translation of this mRNA sequence into the proteins. Uh, the other thing is the endomembrane system. So from its name, it has endo and membrane. So what are we describing? We're describing the rough endoplasmic reticulum right here. And basically everything between the rough endoplasmic reticulum and till, till, like, uh, till the membrane of the cell, which is going to be the rough endoplasmic reticulum, the Golgi apparatus, which is going to give off endosomes, which are small vesicles. And from these endosomes, which will fuse with the membrane until these proteins are going to be released outside the cell. Now, another thing for the endomembrane system, it doesn't only regulate stuff that are going from the cell to the outside environment. It also helps regulate the stuff that are going from outside into the cell by the lysosomes. So what are the organelles that are associated with the endomembrane system? The rough endoplasmic reticulum, the Golgi, the endosomes, the secretory vesicles, and for the stuffs going into the cell, it will be the lysosomes. The lysosomes as well as the endosomes together. Uh, anything that's going from the Golgi outside the cell is going to be endosomes, and anything that's entering the cell is going to be the endosomes. Again, so endosomes are taking stuff from the Golgi to the outside, or anything that's coming into the cell. And the last thing is basically the rough endoplasmic reticulum and the Golgi. Together, the rough endoplasmic reticulum and the Golgi will be responsible for making the proteins that are going to be uh, making the proteins that are going to be uh, prepared to be secreted outside the cell. However, the free ribosomes that are found in the cytoplasm will be used to make the proteins that are found in the cell or to be used in the cell. So let's start now with the main lecture of protein targeting. Before you start, like before you go into the details of how each protein or where each protein is going to go, is going to be delivered to, the main idea that you need to know is whether this protein will be used for the cell or that this protein is going to be used outside the cell or in the membrane or in the lysosome. So if the protein was to be used inside the cell, What's going to happen is that we get the DNA sequence transcribed to an mRNA sequence. The mRNA sequence will bind on the free ribosomes. The free ribosomes will begin the process of translation. They will complete the process of translation. And then these proteins, once they are going to be made inside the cell, they're going to be taken over to the organelle that they're functioning in, such as the nucleus or the, mito or the mitochondria. An example would be the glucokinase found in hepatocytes. Okay? So for the proteins that are going to be used inside the cell, it's going to start in the ribosomes that are found freely in the cytoplasm. It's going to finish there, and then it's going to go over to the location. Now, what happens if the uh, proteins were going to be released? Basically, the, thing, the difference would be that the process of translation, once the mRNA sequence is made, the mRNA sequence will bind on the free ribosomes. And that's where it starts, in the free ribosomes. Always starts in the free ribosomes. However, what happens is basically there's a, uh, the sequence that is going to be made. Now, this sequence will pause the process of translation in the free ribosomes. And then the, and then the free ribosomes will go over to bind on the rough in the plasmic reticulum, where they will finish the process of translation to create these proteins and send them over into the endoplasmic reticulum. And once they're in the endoplasmic reticulum, they will go to the Golgi, to the endosomes, and then to be secreted outside the cell. OK, all clear? Now, the process of uh, basically synthesizing these proteins completely in the free ribosomes will be referred to as post-translation because we basically translated the sequence and made the protein. And then once it's made, we are translocating it. Or, and for the endoplasmic reticulum where the proteins are going to be secreted outside the cell, it is going to be referred to as co-translational. And one last thing that you need to know 
is what are the proteins that are going to be sent into the endoplasmic reticulum uh, sequence of events. It's basically three proteins and only three. The proteins that are going to be put into the membrane, the proteins that are going to be secreted outside the cell, or the proteins that will be put into the lysosomes. And these are going to be enzymes because enzymes can be proteins and in the lysosomes we need enzymes. Okay, all clear? Now, how do we differentiate whether this protein that we just made, is it going to be staying inside the cell or do we need it for cellular use? Or is it going to be used outside the cell? It's basically a sequence or a signal sequence. Now, what a signal sequence is basically, now as a DNA is transcribed into the mRNAs, we have the three nucleotide RNA bases will give one amino acid. When there are multiple amino acids put together in a specific sequence, that will be referred to as a signal sequence. This will basically help direct with where these organs are going or where these proteins are going. Now, this table right here is basically a summary of like some or where each protein is going to what organal and what the sequence should be. The most the two most important ones that you need to know are the ones for the endoplasmic reticulum and the peroxisomes. Now, the thing is like why I put these two as the most important because they're mentioned later on in like the actual lecture slide itself, like they're written as text. Now, I don't really think that you should know these ones. However, if you do have free time, like it doesn't harm to look at them, but the endoplasmic reticulum and the peroxisomes, like you really need to know them. And like, it's not that it's in the table that I'm telling you you need to know them because it's actually mentioned in the text itself. So if he was to get actual questions about these concepts, then it's most likely gonna be one of these two. Now, uh, so for the peroxisomes, what's gonna happen is that basically at the C terminal, okay, let me describe again what the N terminal and the C terminal is. Now, as the protein is being translated, there's basically at the start, there's gonna be an N terminal and then amino acids, amino acids, amino acids, amino acids, and then it's gonna finish with a C terminal or carboxy terminal. For the peroxisomes at the C terminal, we're gonna have three amino acids, serine, lysine, and leucine. It's good to know. But for the endoplasmic reticulum, which is really important, and like a lot of questions would be uh, about the sequence for the endoplasmic reticulum, it's basically at the end terminal, at the beginning, at the end terminal, there will be a sequence of hydrophobic amino acids, which is basically right here, leucine, 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 valine, glycine, isoleucine, phenylalanine. Like it's basically a sequence of hydrophobic amino acids at the end terminal. Now, it does make sense, like, why would it be at the end terminal? Like, if you, if you get confused whether it's at the end terminal or the C terminal, basically, as we said, for the endoplasmic reticulum, it is going to take in the proteins to be released outside the cell. It's going to start in the free ribosomes, right? So as the protein is being translated in this free ribosome and is starting to come out of the ribosome, the first thing that we need to come out is going to be the signal, because then the receptor for the signal is going to bind on the signal before, like, we make a large protein. It just points on the signal as it's being made. It takes this protein and the ribosome together to the endoplasmic reticulum where it can finish its process of translation. Okay. So again, for the sequence for the endoplasmic reticulum or for secretions or for the lysosomes or for the membrane bound protein will be a hydrophobic amino acid at the end terminal. It's basically a summary slide that I made for you guys about all you need to know from the previous slide. Basically how it starts. The DNA in the nucleus is transcribed to an mRNA sequence. This mRNA sequence will be taken into the cytoplasm. It's going to be translated to proteins. Now, we need these proteins inside the cell and outside the cell. What's the difference going to be? So if it's going to be used inside the cell, it's going to start in free ribosomes, where the process of translation starts in free ribosomes, where it's going to complete the translation. The protein is made. The protein is prepared and all ready. And then it's going to move over to the location where it needs to function. So it's a post-translation, translocation process. If this was to be sent to the membrane or to the lysosomes or to be sent outside the cell, it is going to start the process in the ribosomes. It is going to pause its translation. It is going to go over to the rough endoplasmic reticulum. And then it's going to complete the translation process. And then it's going to be released into the endoplasmic reticulum and through the endomembrane system. So since the translation is occurring in two places at the free ribosomes at the endoplasmic and the endoplasmic reticulum, it is going to be referred to as co-translation. 
it always starts the free ribosomes, whether it was to be used inside the cell or whether it was to be secreted outside the cell. And the last thing is, how does it decide where the protein, whether the protein is going into the cell and what organ in the cell, or whether it's going to be sent outside the cell? A signal sequence from the amino acid chain that's basically uh, made from the translation process, it's basically going to be bound over by a signal recognition particle or a receptor that's gonna take it to where it needs to function. And right there, I wrote again, the signal for the rough endoplasmic reticulum or for the secreted, the lysosomes and the membrane, it is gonna be an N-terminal hydrophobic signal sequence. Uh, uh, can you repeat A and B? A and B, okay. Again, we are going to make these proteins and we need them either for cell function or for function outside the cell. The difference would be is that the proteins that are going to be made for cellular function, the process of translating these proteins will begin in the ribosomes. And then when it's, once it's made in the ribosomes, it's gonna complete its translation process in the ribosomes that are found freely in the cytoplasm. And then it's gonna be taken over to the location where it needs to function, such as the nucleus or the mitochondria or any like organ inside the cell. This is referred to as post-translation. Why is it post-translation? Because we finish the translation in the free ribosome and then we move them over. It's post-translation, translocation. I didn't add translocation, but it's post-translation, translocation. Like basically moving it is gonna be done after we've done translating it. For the- So basically uh, in A, what happens is that we translate it and we like divide it and it is a in, in the cell membrane. Uh, and the cell uh, cytoplasm, and we also turn like we add the sequence in the cell cytoplasm, and then we move it in the translocation. Meanwhile, okay. in B, we oh, so there you just, yeah, the sequence you don't add the sequence, the sequence is part of the chain, a part of the protein chain itself. Uh huh, so, okay. So, if we start first of all with the DNA sequence, we transcribe this DNA sequence into mRNA. So, let's say we got, for example, AUG, uh, UAA, UGA, UGC, for example, okay? And then the sequence uh, we got gave you, like we said, three amino acids would give one protein, right? Uh, no, no, three, uh, I mean, three nucleotides would give one amino acid, right? Yes. Yeah, so let's say we have, for example, uh, nine amino acids uh, or nine nucleotides. So we're gonna have one, two, three, or for example, or we got all these amino acids from the nucleotides, okay? Now, the cell itself will recognize when we have, for example, arginine here, and then here, and then lysine, and then arginine, the cell will recognize this sequence of proteins that was made, and then it will be like, oh, okay, I should take this protein to the mitochondria, and those takes it takes it over to the mitochondria. It's not that we're adding this sequence; we're just recognizing the sequence that's already found there. Okay, so you get it? Yes, I get it. Okay, and so for B, it goes over the same thing. We start the process of trans of translating the protein in the ribosomes. Once we translate it, the first thing that will come out, since we start from the end terminal, the first thing that will come out will be the signal, the signal, which is basically the hydrophobic amino acids. This signal will be recognized, and once it's recognized, it could go over to the rough endoplasmic reticulum to finish the process of translation. And then it's going to be released. Now, don't focus too much on the process here, because I'm going to describe it in a second. Like the most important thing you need to know is that it's going to be for, secret for secretions or for the membrane or for the lysosomal proteins. This is like probably like, because I won't go, go over this topic again or this concept again. I will go over how it's gonna be made later. Okay, any questions? Can you please repeat C? Uh, so no, C is basically for both. C is for both. It always starts in the free ribosomes. Whenever you're starting the translation process, it starts in the free ribosomes. If it's going to be, the, if the proteins are going to be used inside the cell, it starts in the free ribosomes and it finishes in the free ribosomes. And that's why it's referred to as post-translation translocation. If it was going to be sent outside into the membrane or to the lysosome, it is gonna start in the free ribosomes and then it's gonna pause, it's gonna stop. It will go over to the endoplasmic reticulum with the ribosome itself, and then it will continue there. I'm gonna discuss it in a second if you don't get it. Okay, let, let me go over it first 
And then I'll take you back, I'll take you back over if you have any questions about this part. Okay. Now, now next thing we'll go over is basically the process of translocation. In order to make it easy for you, basically there's a common theme that goes around whether it's going to be sent outside the nucleus or like sent outside the cell or for intracellular organs. What happens is the amino acid is going to be translated and the signal will pop off. This signal will be recognized by a receptor or signal recognition particle. The signal recognition particle binds on the signal and holds the protein and takes it over by hand or takes the ribosomes. If it was for, it's going, to, it's going to be secreted outside the cell, it will take the ribosomes. If it was a protein that's already made, the signal recognition particle will take the protein by hand and take it over to where it needs to function. What happens is the GTP or ATP will be used. Hydrolysis of GTP or ATP is basically like using these GTPs and ATP. Why do we need this ATP? We're going to remove the signal recognition particle and push the protein into the cell. Once the protein goes through the channel into the cell, we're gonna cut off the signal because we got, we got the protein where we need it. Yeah, we don't need the signal anymore. So we cut off the signal and now the protein is gonna be folded and it's gonna be ready for function. Now, keep this in mind when we go over every organelle or every, uh, every process because it's basically all gonna follow the same mechanism. Okay, let's start first of all with the endoplasmic reticulum or the proteins that are going to be directed mainly for outside the cell or lysosomes or the membrane. Now, what happens is the translation process starts in the ribosome. If you look here, this is a ribosome found freely in the cytoplasm. And this is the strand. So the translation starts in the free ribosomes. And as it's translating this protein, it's gonna give off a signal sequence. What was the signal sequence again? It was the hydrophobic amino acid sequence at the end terminal. So at the end terminal or at the start, because we don't want to make the entire protein and then start moving it around if you want to secrete it. We're going to start slightly with it. And then at the end terminal, it's going to be recognized. It's going to be recognized by a signal recognition particle or SRP. The signal recognition particle recognizes the signal and then it takes the ribosome this time, not the protein because we don't have the full protein. It takes the ribosome by hand and takes it over to the endoplasmic reticulum. At the endoplasmic reticulum, we're gonna have a membrane, or, or, or at the endoplasmic reticulum, we're gonna have a receptor. The receptor is for the SRP, for the signal recognition particle. So the signal recognition particle takes the ribosome and binds on it and sits on the receptor. Now the receptor is made of an alpha and the beta chain. All you need to know is that basically the alpha chain and the signal recognition particle, both of them will have a GTP. GTP is similar to ATP, it's, it's a form of energy. And they're both going to break down their GTPs into GDP or use the GTP. And we said we use this energy for two things, to push the, uh, to push the protein into the organelle or to get, and, and to get rid of the receptor. So once the signal recognition particle and its receptor are breaking down their GTPs to GDP, they can remove the signal recognition particle which basically removes the pores that was put on the ribosomes. And so the signal recognition particle is removed and we open up a translocon, which is basically like a channel that's found on the endoplasmic reticulum membrane. What happens now is that the ribosomes can com complete the translation process. Remember it started freely in the ribos it started free in the cytoplasm and now it's over in the endoplasmic reticulum. It completes the process of translation and pushes this protein sequence into the endoplasmic reticulum bloom. Now, as it enters, there's gonna be a signal peptidase, which is gonna cut off the signal because we got the protein where we need it. We got it into the endoplasmic reticulum, so we don't need the signal anymore. We remove the signal and then the protein can fold and it's gonna be ready for secretion or the next step. Do you guys get the previous part now that I got this part down? And do you get this part? Do you have any questions about this one before we go to the next step? All clear. Okay. So now once we made this protein uh, and, and we put the protein in the endoplasmic reticulum, again, we said we're gonna need it to be secreted or to be put into the membrane or for the lysosomes. What happens in the endoplasmic reticulum and the Golgi apparatus together, they will work on modifying and preparing this protein to be released. Basically, they're trying to create something known as a glycoprotein. Now, what's a glycoprotein? It's basically glyco for sugar and the protein. 
So it's basically a sugar and a protein. We already made the protein. So what's left only is gonna be adding the sugar. So once the protein is in the endoplasmic reticulum, we're going to add the sugar by a process referred to as glycosylation. Glycosylation is basically just putting on the sugar, on the protein. Now the sugar is made, and then this protein is gonna get folded in the endoplasmic reticulum. It's really important to know that the folding takes place in the endoplasmic reticulum. And then once it's folded and ready and all packaged, it can be sent over to the Golgi. And then in the Golgi, it can be further modified or edited or like whatever you want to start in the Golgi. And then it's gonna be released outside the cell. And the folding process occurs by chaperones. What are chaperones? They're basically like proteins that are assisting in the folding process, okay? So we set the proteins there. We're gonna add the sugar on the protein. We're gonna fold the protein and package it. And then we can send it over to the Golgi and then to secretory pesticides to release outside the cell. Now, this slide is about glycosylation. It's a really important slide, but what I didn't like about it, and also last year when we were studying it, is that it's very hectic and everything is combined with each other. So I tried to like break it down for you guys to what you need to know, like to organize it properly. So let's start with the all linked glycosylation. So again, glycosylation, we're just adding the sugar. And all linked glycosylation is basically going to be adding the sugar at the, at the O part, at the O particle, okay? Now, all linked glycosylation takes place in the Golgi apparatus because you, you know there's an O here, there's an O here. So O, O for Golgi apparatus, okay? So all linked takes place in the Golgi apparatus. What happens is, we're gonna have serine and the threonine residues or amino acids that are found in this protein. These guys will have a sugar added on them. And what's the sugar? It's the N-acetylgalactosamine. Not, it's basically the N-acetylgalactosamine sugar. And how you would know it because there's, you know, always a circle and then there's a circle here and then there's a circle here and then a circle here. While here there's basically, there's no not much circles. So N-acetylgalactosamine, circles and circles and circles, is for the all linked glycosylation. Okay, so let's go over it again. All linked glycosylation is gonna take place in the Golgi apparatus where we're adding an N acetylgalactosamine sugar over on the serine and the threonine residues. Now, since it's taking place in the Golgi apparatus, and we said the protein must be folded first in the endoplasmic reticulum before it can go over uh, to the Golgi apparatus. So it's gonna be the, the glycosylation process takes place after the protein has been folded and sent over to the Golgi. Okay. Now for the N-linked glycosylation, it's basically gonna take place in the rough endoplasmic reticulum, where an N-acetylglucosamine sugar will be added on the aspergine residues. And uh, the way I like to like remember it, you know, just just like when you're studying, you don't use you don't need to use what I do, but just do something similar. Because you know this N goes over like this, which is kind of similar to how the U goes, that little peak right there. Like try to find these clues yourself, because when you do something like that, like on your own, it will help stick in your memory. Okay. So again, the N-linked glycosylation is basically going to have an N-acetylglucosamine residue or sugar added on aspergine residues in the rough in the plasmic reticulum. Therefore, it's taking place before there's going to be folding. Once the sugar is added, we're going to fold it over by chaperones. If it fails to fold by chaperones, what's going to happen is that the protein is non-functional. The protein must be folded in order to carry out its functions. And if we can't fold it, then the protein is useless. Now, when protein is useless or not functional, what happens in the body? Basically, something known as ubiquitin is going to be put over on the protein. And if a protein is tagged by ubiquitin, it's basically going to take it. It's going to take it into a proteasome and then breaks down this protein. Now, okay, you get this concept. If there is a failure in folding, so the protein is non-functional, we're going to have ubiquitin being put over on the protein, and so basically it's tagged for degradation. It's going to be taken over to the proteasome and to be broken down. An example would be uh, the mutation in the cystic fibrosis that we'll talk about later in a second. Okay, now. Once the protein is folded and all ready, it's gonna be sent over to the Golgi apparatus where it's gonna have further modifications until it's prepared to be released outside with the endosomes and then goes over to where we need it. Now, what I mean by examples in the previous slide is basically, we said the rough endoplasmic reticulum can send them over to the lysosomes or it can send them over to the membrane. Some proteins that will go to the membrane will be like insulin, 
uh, outside the cells, or it could be for the membrane, or I mean, some of the proteins for outside the cell. And the proteins that are going to be used for the membrane will be uh, stuff such as the LDL receptors. Okay, is this clear? Okay, so the next thing you need to know is that, as you said, we're gonna go over, now, the next thing we're gonna go over the secretory and the lysosomal proteins. How are they gonna be signaled to go over to the, to the lysosome or to be sent out to, for secretion? Now, this slide, uh, for us, we had a separate lecture uh, for fibrous proteins. I was gonna kind of skip over the slide, not gonna go into too much details over it, but then I looked at you guys' schedule, but you don't have that lecture. Uh, so like for us last year, we didn't have this slide at all. So given that you guys don't have that lecture and you have this slide added, so they probably told Dr. Abdul Jabbar to add this lecture for you. And then you most likely will have a question about it because like they didn't add it for no reason. It's really important slide. So I'm, I'm gonna go over like the most important stuff that you need to know. Now a protein, when a protein is gonna be made, sometimes protein will be made in the pre-pro form. A pre-pro form is basically like the protein that's, completely inactive protein it needs to be modified but it's like it's just the protein that's made now once the protein whether it's collagen or any other protein that you will take later on that is found in the pre-pro form we're going to have to break down the pre to make it a pro collagen and then we're going to have to take off the collagen usually like later is going to be a pre-pro for example like a pre-pro uh, uh i honestly don't remember like what hormones we had but like let's say anything other than collagen it will be a pre-pro a pre-pro hormone to a pro hormone to the hormone, which is going to be functional. But for collagen, it's a little bit different. It's going to be a pre-pro collagen to a pro collagen. And then this pro collagen will be released outside the cell to become the tropo collagen. And then from tropo collagen, it will become the actual collagen. So it's just the tropo, the tropo part that is not really uh, included with other hormones. Okay. So, the diff so this is how it's going to go. Now, a pre-pro collagen, which is basically like the completely inactive collagen. It's just the collagen that's been translated. It's gonna have a glycine X and Y, where the X and Y are usually proline or lysine. Now, since there is glycine in every one, and they're basically like three, you know? So one third of all the collagen will be made of glycine, which is an important concept that you need to know that one third of the collagen will be made of glycine. Now, once the pre-pro collagen is made, the next step will be the hydroxylation. What does hydroxylation mean? We're basically adding a hydroxyl group. Like anything that ends with lation, we're basically trying to put it on there, okay? So glycosylation, we're putting on the sugar. Hydroxylation, we're putting on the hydroxylase or the hydroxyl group. So hydroxylation, we're basically adding a hydroxyl on the proline and the lysine. Now this step is important because it requires vitamin C. So any deficiency in this process would lead to scurvy. I'm not sure that you, if you guys need to know the name of the diseases as well, uh, but I suggest you know them, like because we had like a complete lecture about it. So I'm not really sure what they want to know from this slide. So try to like try to learn everything. They're probably gonna get a question about it. Okay. So again, let's let's go over it again. If we have the pre-pro collagen, we're gonna hydroxylate it, add over hydroxyl residue, and then we're gonna glycosylate it. The gly uh, the hydroxylation, the I mean the glycosylation will take place on the hydroxylysine residues. Okay. So the lysine and the proline got hydroxylated to hydroxylysine and hydroxyproline. And then the hydroxylysine, we're gonna have a sugar added on it. And then once it's glycosylated with a sugar, it's gonna create a triple helix, which is basically uh, the three or like the collagen will start folding around each other and create a triple helix structure that will be connected by hydrogen and disulfide bonds. The triple helix structure, if there was a problem in formation of this triple helix, this will lead to a disease called osteogenesis imperfecta. And now once it's in the triple helix form, it is a procollagen. And now all of this process is taking place in the endoplasmic reticulum. Now, after it's done from the endoplasmic reticulum and we completely folded it into the triple helix structure, it can be sent over to the Golgi. So it goes over to the Golgi, it goes over to the endosomes, and then it's gonna get released outside the cell. Once it's released, the, the, the C terminal and the N terminal will be cut off. And once they're cut off, this is gonna be referred to as tropocollagen, which is basically like an insoluble form of collagen because we don't want it to dissolve over uh, in, the, in, the, in the plasma or the extracellular matrix around. 
So we cut off the C-thermal and the N-thermal to create this insoluble collagen. Then we take multiple collagens, put them over each other, beside each other, and then we're going to create cross links between them to hold a strong collagen fiber. Now this is gonna be done by an enzyme known as lysyl oxidase, and it requires copper. Okay, so I wrote right here like uh, what you need for this step, for the hydroxidation step, you require vitamin C, and any deficiency would lead to scurvy. And for the cross-linking step, it's gonna be done by the lysyl oxidase enzyme, and it's gonna require copper. Is it clear to you guys? Because like, I think you really need to know this one. Okay, can I repeat? Do you need me to repeat the entire process or is there anything specific that you need to understand like you didn't get? Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go over it all again, but faster this time. So it all starts with a pre-pro collagen. We need to convert this pre-pro collagen into a pro collagen. We're releasing the pro collagen outside the cell to make a tropo collagen. We put multiple tropo collagens over each other to create a collagen fiber. Now, the pre-pro collagen, in order to get converted to pro collagen, it requires two steps, hydroxylation and glycosylation. The hydroxylation will basically add the hydroxyl residue over like, see, this is a hydroxyl residue. Uh, one second, so this is a hydroxyl residue and this is a hydroxyl residue. We're adding them onto the protein. This, require, this process requires vitamin C. So if you don't have vitamin C, you can't do hydroxylation and there you're gonna have something known as scurvy. So we went from proline and lysine to hydroxyproline, hydroxylysine. The next step will be glycosylation or adding a sugar. The sugar will be added over on the hydroxylysine. So sugar is gonna be put over on hydroxylysine. And then once that is done, we're gonna create a triple helix, which is basically folding of the collagen. We're gonna fold this collagen or the three collagen, the three, three collagen chains we get folded around each other by creating hydrogen bonds and disulfide bonds. Once that's done, we're gonna have our pro-collagen. And if there was deficiency in this triple helix structure, we're gonna have osteogenesis imperfecta because the collagen is basically like, it's weak. It's not, it hasn't created these bonds and hasn't created this triple helix structure. So it's gonna lead to osteogenesis imperfecta. Now this all takes place in the, in the, in the plasmic reticulum because we said the folding process takes place in the endoplasmic reticulum. Once that's done, it's gonna be sent over to the Golgi apparatus. So once it's in the Golgi, it's gonna get modified and it's gonna get put into an endosome and released outside the cell through the process of exocytosis. Outside the cell, we have right here, this is a pro-collagen, a triple helix structure of a pro-collagen. We remove the C terminal, which is basically at the end, and the N terminal, which is at the start. We cut them off. And this creates a tropical collagen that's insoluble because we don't want the collagen, since it's basically like making up the extracellular matrix, we don't want it to be like soluble and dissolving in the fluids. We want it to be firm and insoluble. That's why we cleave off the, the ends, the C end and the N ends. And this gonna create a tropical collagen. And then we take multiple tropical collagens, put them over each other, around each other, and create cross links right there. So th this is a cross link right here and a cross link between the, col between the tropical collagens in order to create a strong collagen fiber. And this process is gonna be carried out by lysyl oxidase, which requires copper in order to function. And if you had a problem in this step, you'd gonna have a disease known as Menke's disease. Uh, excuse me? Yes. Uh, I understand it, but uh, can I explain it so that I can make sure like I understand it really well? Okay, sure. If you don't mind. Yeah. Okay, first thing first, uh, we have to synthesize the uh, the propo collagen. So we have to create the propo collagen. After creating it, we have to add, uh, uh, we have to do two we steps. We start with the have... pro collagen. Oh, yeah, sorry. Then... Mm. Uh, then after that, we have to add two, uh, two groups. The hydroxyl group, it's also known as the hydroxylation into the end part. And then we add the sugar group, also known as the uh, glycylation to the hydroxyl uh, lysine uh, group. Mm -hmm. After this, we have to fold it really well. And then uh, uh, we, uh, uh, we, we cut the end parts and then we release them. Right? No, we release it and, and then we cut the end parts. We cut the end parts. Yeah, after, after this, 
Yes, okay. And after this, uh, we add them together uh, and that's it, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, but no the enzymes and no yeah, the, the subunit, which is what, like what is just here and it's uses vitamin C here. Okay. And I think you should also know like what the disease that would, it would cause if it was deficient. Like if you said a person who's like, he's not, he's not able to create uh, or he's deficient in copper, what's the disease he could have is a main case disease. Or if he described a situation where a person like he said, he couldn't create cross links, and he asked like, "What is probably deficient?" And it's going to be copper. Uh, we add the end parts. What do you mean we add the end parts? We don't add uh, like there's nothing specific about an end part. Like it's all, only all you need to know is that the C terminal on the end terminal, which is basically the end, will be cut off and released because. Once we cut them off, we're gonna make the collision insoluble. We're not, we're not adding anything together. We just, the only addition is gonna be occurring in this step uh, and like here in the hydroxylation and the gly glycosylation part. We're gonna add hydroxyl and we're gonna add a sugar. And then once we add the hydroxyl and the sugar, it could be sent over to the Golgi and create a triple helix. We're gonna send it over to the Golgi, send it outside the cell, cut off the ends and then create the cross links. All clear? Okay. Uh, so now the next thing will be sent. So we said now the previous one was an example of these proteins that will be sent outside the cell. Now proteins that will be sent into the lysosomes will include like the enzymes, right? Because lysosomes proteins are basically enzymes that are responsible for breaking down whatever we're taking into the cell. Okay, so again, it's going to start with the ribosome from the cell found freely in the cytoplasm. It's going to start the process of translation in the ribosomes, where we'll take over to the rough endoplasmic reticulum by the signal. And very important, what was the signal? At the end terminal, there was a hydrophobic sequence. And then we're going to translate the proteins. And once we made these proteins and all, we're going to start the process of modification. Now, this is basically the tricky part about the lysosomal enzymes. OK? So once the protein is made and it's in the endoplasmic reticulum, the first step will be glycosylating it, N-linked glycosylation, or by adding an N-acetyl glucosamine in the rough endoplasmic reticulum. Now, this N-acetyl glucosamine that will be added over on these enzymes, it's going to have a lot of mannose, which is an important sugar in the next step. Okay, you need to know that this sugar that's going to be added on these enzymes will have a lot of mannose. Now, after we glycosylated it, we can fold it over and then we send it to the Golgi. In the Golgi, what happens is this mannose will be recognized by an enzyme known as the N-acetylglucosamine 1-phosphotransferase. It's a very important enzyme because it basically this, it determines whether this, these enzymes will go over to the lysosomes or not. This specific enzyme, the N-acetylglucosamine phosphotransferase. What it does is that once it sees this mannose in the N-acetylglucosamine, it will add a phosphate. Phosphate transferase is basically a transferring a phosphate over on this enzyme. So it sees the mannose, it puts a phosphate on the mannose. Once this mannose is phosphorylated, it will be recognized by a specific receptor. Like this is a special receptor that only recognizes phosphorylated mannose. If this receptor recognizes the phosphorylated mannose, it will take it into its own endosome and it will take it from its own endosome to the lysosome. Now in this endosome, what happens is, or like there are two special characteristics about the endosome, is that it has low pH, which is basically gonna remove the receptor off of the enzyme. And then once we remove the receptor, we can recycle it to use it back. And then it's also gonna have a phosphatase to remove the phosphate off of the enzyme because we need to use the enzyme, right? So we're gonna take off the phosphate. And once we remove this phosphate and we remove the receptor, we can take this endosome join it with the lysosome and release the enzymes into the lysosomes, okay? So again, start in the endoplasmic reticulum. Like the main difference would be here. We're gonna have n acetyl glycosylation or n linked glycosylation. Once it's glycosylated, it's gonna get folded and sent over to the Golgi. In the Golgi, the mannose residues will be phosphorylated by this enzyme, n acetyl glucosamine phosphotransferase. If it's phosphorylated, it can bind on a special receptor that only recognizes phosphorylated mannose. It binds on this receptor 
it takes it over to the endosome, which takes it over to the lysosome, and it can take it can carry out its function. In the endosome, there is low pH, and there's a phosphatase in order to remove the receptor and to remove the phosphate that were added on the enzyme so that the enzyme can be completely functional. Now, a deficiency in the enzyme, in acetyl glucosamine phosphotransferase, will lead to a disease known as eye cell disease or mucolipidosis type 2 disease or like inclusion cell disease or anything that's referred to as a storage disorder like a, a disorder like a storage cell disease is basically talking about a lysosomal deficiency. Now, since it's a lysosomal deficiency, what's basically the main idea is that there is no enzymes in the lysosomes. So the N-acetoglucosamine phosphotransferase is not able to put the phosphate on the mannose. And since it's not able to put the phosphate on the mannose, it's basically not gonna bind on its special, it's not gonna, there's no mannose phosphate, it's not gonna bind on its special receptor, and it cannot be taken into the lysosome. What happens instead is that this mannose sugar will be sent outside the cell, okay? So it will be secreted outside the cell instead of going to the lysosomes. And because the lysosome doesn't have its enzymes anymore, what happens is basically any structures from outside the cell, as they go into the cell, they need to go to the lysosomes. And the lysosome doesn't have its enzymes to break down these structures. So they're gonna start accumulating inside the cell or inside the lysosomes, and they will be referred to as something known as inclusions. Like inclusions is basically just like accumulations inside the cell, because you know, inclusions, okay? Now symptoms, uh, read them, go over them, but you don't really like need to memorize what happens in this because like you're, you're still first year, uh, you don't really need to know them because most likely the scenario that you're gonna get will have a clue about what the problem is. You won't just have symptoms and tell you what's the problem, but read them, they might help you in understanding what's going around, okay? Now, this is about uh, uh, lysosomes. Do you have any questions or any questions about like, the secretory process before we go over to the, the proteins for the cell? Can I repeat the lysosomes? Uh, do you need the disease or do you need the process of the lysosomes? I'll put it here for you guys if you want to read it. Okay, so the process of the lysosome, what happens is basically, we just made the proteins that are going to be, again, we said, anything that any proteins that will be put into the membrane or secreted outside the cell or in the lysosomes will require to go to the rough endoplasmic reticulum. And the signal will be at the end terminal, there will be a hydrophobic amino acid sequence. Anyways, it's in the endoplasmic reticulum. We completed, so completed the process of translation. And now we're gonna start the modification. And this is basically the trick for the lysosomal enzymes. The modification will be is that in the endoplasmic reticulum, the first step is an N-linked glycosylation, where we'll add an N-acetyl glucosamine. Okay, this N-acetyl glucosamine will be rich in the sugar known as mannose. Keep that in the back of your head. We added the N-linked glycosylation, we folded the enzymes or the proteins, and then we sent them to the Golgi. The Golgi will recognize this mannose. And the Golgi apparatus has a specific enzyme known as an N-acetylglucosamine phosphotransferase. It puts a phosphate on the N-acetylglucosamine. What part of the N-acetylglucosamine? The mannose. Therefore, the mannose will become phosphorylated mannose. Once there is phosphorylated mannose, it will be recognized by a special receptor that only recognizes phosphorylated mannose. This special receptor will take this phosphorylated mannose and put it in an endosome. Two special characteristics about the endosomes. I don't really think you guys should know them because they weren't mentioned in your slides, but they were mentioned for our slides last year. So that's where I brought them from. But it's good to know. Like, I mean, it's a, it's a simple concept. We had we just put, like, see here the enzyme, we put a receptor on it and the phosphate. So we need to get rid of the receptor first and the phosphate. How do we get rid of the receptor? We remove it by the pH of the endosome. The pH removes the receptor and then it can get recycled. How do we remove the phosphate? But a phosphatase enzyme, phosphatase removes the phosphate. So the phosphate is removed, and then this, uh, this enzyme will be sent over to the lysosome. All clear? Uh, the manual 6 phosphate is basically uh, the enzyme that has the, what, what is this uh, M6P? Manose 6 phosphate is phosphorylated manose. What does the 6 mean? It means like, so the mannose is sugar, like multiple residues. At the sixth 
uh, residue of the manose, we're going to have a phosphate. OK, so it's basically manose that has a phosphate at the sixth residue. And then this phosphorylated manose can be recognized by the special receptor that will take it to the lysosome. If it's not phosphorylated, it cannot be recognized by the special receptor. Therefore, it will be sent outside the cell, which will lead to the eye cell disease or the inclusion cell disease. Okay. Clear. Okay. Now, the next thing would be the proteins for the cells that are going to be, uh, or the proteins for the cell organelles. There's not going to be secreted. We're not sending them to the lysosomes. We're not sending them to the membrane. Now, the first organelle will be the nucleus. So what happens is for the nucleus, the protein, since it's in the cell, we're going to use it for cellular use, it's going to be completely translated in the free ribosomes. And then once it's translated, we're going to move it over to where we need it, which is basically the nucleus this time. Now, once it's translated, it's going to have a signal, right? It always starts with a signal. Now, this signal, which is going to be referred to as the nuclear localization signal, the nuclear localization signal will be bound by a receptor, which is the nuclear import receptor or the importer. The receptor holds the protein and takes it by hand to where it needs to go, which is basically passes through the pores into the nucleus. In the nucleus, what happens is RAN GTP is going to bind on the receptor. RAN GTP here binds on the receptor that has the protein. What it does, again, we said we use GTP for two things to put the protein in the organelle and you know, like we use the, remove the receptor and to use the energy to, to put the protein in the organelle. So once RAN GTP is bound on the receptor, it's going to hydrolyze its GTP and it's going to get rid of the receptor right here. So see RAN GTP hydrolyzed its GTP to GTP, got rid of the receptor and pushed the, the protein into the nucleus. Clear? Like it's all about this, the same concept that we discussed in this, at the beginning. You have the signal, which is the nuclear localization signal. It gets bound on by a receptor which is the nuclear import receptor. The receptor takes it by hand, goes over to the nucleus, and then the nucleus is gonna get, it's gonna use GTP. And this GTP comes from where? Comes from RAN GTP. RAN GTP uses the GTP for two things, to push the protein into the nucleus and leave the protein in the nucleus and to get rid of the receptor. And then this receptor again will be recycled and used to push more protein into the nucleus. Okay. Okay, next one will be for the mitochondria. Now the mitochondria is a little bit different because basically the mitochondria, uh, now this basically here is a bunch of general information about the mitochondria. Why I crossed off this part because I'll discuss it in a second, the next slide. Like this slide just focus on the general information. 10 to 15% of nuclear genes code for mitochondrial proteins were basically because the mitochondria itself is gonna have its own DNA to make its protein, that's why most of the proteins of the mitochondria will be made from the mitochondria itself. However, some of the proteins will be taken in from the nucleus. Now, these proteins that will be taken on from the nucleus will be recognized. Again, they're going to have the signal. And this signal will be recognized by specific receptors. The, the key difference here is that the receptors, unlike, for example, in the nucleus or in the, in the plasmic reticulum pathway, the receptor is not found in the cytoplasm. It doesn't bind it in the cytoplasm. It takes it over uh, to the mitochondria. Instead, the receptor is basically found on the mitochondria itself. So the mitochondria has an outer membrane and an inner membrane. On the outer membrane, there is a complex of proteins known as TOM, the translocase of the outer membrane. It's basically a complex of proteins that has receptors and the channels to, that has receptors. It has translocation channels to push the protein in. And in the inner membrane, we're going to have a TIM which is a translocase of the inner membrane. And again, it's a similar concept. It has receptors, it has the channels to push it in, okay? And the last part you need to know is that chaperones, again, are gonna come here in handy. We need chaperones, as we mentioned earlier, in order to fold the proteins. And once they are folded, they are functional. If they're not folded, they're not functional. Now, here's the slide that I uh, changed a little bit of information. Explain to you the basic concept to go to go over the like to go over what's happening. Now ignore the picture. You don't need to know anything about the picture, although like some fun names. But like you don't need to know. I just put this picture so like you can tell apart this slide from the previous slide. Like this part, you know, it gets more technical. Now the tom and the tim, the outer membrane and the inner membrane. 
are complexes, which is basically a group of protein that are going to have a receptor, and they're also going to have a channel. Now, what's important between the TOM and the TIM is that they are coupled together. What does that mean? It's basically, as the protein passes through TOM, it's going to get bound on by TIM to be pushed inside the cell. Okay, so the protein, as it goes through TOM, it's going to be bound by TIM and pushed into the cell. They're working together. They're coupled together. And the last thing is going to be the energy that's going to be used. Again, we said we use the energy in order to remove the receptor and to push it in. Now, for the mitochondria, the energy will be supplied by ATP and by the H+, which is basically now in the membrane, right here, because there's electron transport chain that's going to be taking place and all this stuff. So outside the cell, there will be hot, or like in the intermembrane space, right? So this is all like a mitochondrial membrane. Mitochondria has a double membrane. In the space between both membranes, there will be H+, which will create electrochemical gradient, and as well as the ATP that's going to be used in this part and in this part in order to push the protein through. Now, this is a general concept, and now let's go into what exactly happens. So, protein has, since it's basically going to be put in the mitochondria, again, we go over the main concept that's going to be made in the ribosomes, completed the translation, the signal is released, and then it's going to be taken over. What happens is that we're going to have a cytosolic HSP, or what's an HSP70? It's a chaperone that are found in the cytosol. So the cytosolic chaperones do a little bit of a different function this time. Like we said usually that chaperones are responsible for the folding process, but like when it comes to this process in the mitochondria, what they do, the HSP70 in this case, they bind on this protein and they prevent it from folding because we don't want it to fold in the cytoplasm. We need to fold inside the mitochondria. We don't want it functional in the cytoplasm. So the HSP70 will bind on this protein, prevents it from folding. And then it takes it over instead of the, this time, there won't be a cytoplasmic receptor. The HSP70 kind of does the same function. It takes it over, takes this protein by hand over to the TOM complex. In the TOM complex, there is a receptor and there is a translocation channel. The receptor recognizes the signal and then it will use the ATP to remove the cytosolic HSP70, to remove the HSP70, and to push the protein into the cell, okay? So we use the ATP, break it down to ADP in order to release the HSP 70s and we're pushing the protein into the cell. We said that the TOM and the TIM are coupled together. So as it's entering through TOM, it's gonna interact with TIM. And now the signal is gonna be placed right there. It's gonna be placed in a good way that allows it, as it's pushed through the outer membrane, it could go to the inner membrane immediately. Now, in order to push it through the inner membrane, this time, this is so it's basically an inner membrane space. To push it into the inner membrane, we're going to use the H plus gradient as the energy process, as the energy supply. So it goes from the outer membrane to the inner membrane. Now it uses the H, the, the H plus gradient. Now, as it's pushed into the inner membrane, there's going to be a signal peptidase that's going to cut off the signal because it just entered the mitochondria. So we cut off the signal and then mitochondrial HSP70, which is basically another chaperone for the mitochondria. It's gonna bind on the protein as it's being pushed through the TIM. It pulls it in, and how does it do that? Using ATP. So it pulls it in using ATP, and then the chaperone this time allows for the folding of the protein. And once it's folded, it's gonna be functional. Okay, I'm gonna go over again in like a few words. Basically, the protein is made in the cytoplasm, Cytosolic HSP70 binds on it instead of a receptor because the receptors are found in the mitochondria itself this time. The HSP70 chaperone is going to prevent it from folding because we don't want it to fold in the mitochondria, the cytoplasm, because that's where, not where we need it to function. The HSP70 takes it over to the mitochondria. It reacts with the TOM complex, which uses ATP. ATP is used to get rid of the HSP70 and to push it into the cell. As it's pushed into the cell, the tone or the outer membrane and the inner membrane translocases are coupled together. So as it's pushed from the outer membrane, interacts with the inner membrane, so we pushed into the cell. Again, this time, it will use the H plus gradient as energy in order to get it out of the inner membrane space. And then as it's getting, pu getting pushed inside the mitochondrial matrix, so the mitochondrial matrix basically refers to this area here. So this is the cytoplasm, this is the intermitochondrial membrane, and this is the mitochondrial matrix. In order to push it into the mitochondrial matrix, we're going to use HSP70 chaperone. It's going to hold it, going to push it through or take it through down, uses ATP this time. 
Okay, and then it's gonna fold it to B function. All clear? Yes. Okay. Last part is the peroxisomes. Now, peroxisomes is basically it's it's not that complicated. It's a simple part. Now, basically, I started by describing like why we need peroxisomes. Basically, peroxisomes are gonna be using oxidative enzymes or oxidative reactions in order to basically detoxify oxygen species. Or most importantly, we'll talk about the function in the next slide. Now, let's talk about the trafficking again to peroxisomes. What happens is there's a protein that's made. Since the peroxisome is going to be part of the intracellular process, the protein is completely made inside the cytoplasm as a post-translational process. What happens is that the signal will be recognized by peroxins, which are basically receptors on the peroxisome, peroxin, peroxin 5 and peroxin 2, and they're going to pull it through. That's all you need to know. The protein is made. It's going to have a signal sequence, which is serine, leucine, and leucine at the C terminal or like at the end. At, at the end terminal was at the beginning. The C terminal is at the end. So it's going to have serine, lysine, leucine at the end. The peroxin 5 and peroxin 2 are going to pull this peroxisome into, or the, the protein into the peroxisome. And then we got, we got the protein inside the peroxisome. That's all, that's all what happens. Now, a mutation in the peroxin 2 protein will lead to a disease known as Zellweger syndrome which is basically a disease uh, where the peroxisome doesn't have uh, the, peroxi the, peroxis the peroxisome doesn't have its proteins because the receptor that takes these proteins inside is non-functional, which is the peroxin 2. So it's going to have something known as the empty peroxisomes. Now, another thing that you need to know is that basically peroxisomes or okay, proteosomes. Okay, never mind. It's not related. No. Proteosomes. What are proteosomes used for? Proteosomes, from its name, proteosome, it's basically used to break down the proteins, okay? So proteosomes are used to break down the protein. We said for a protein to be broken down, it should be tagged by a specific structure known as ubiquitin. Ubiquitin is going to be tagging the proteins for degradation. Once it's tagged with ubiquitin, it's going to go over to the proteosome to be broken down. Now, what this slide is trying to describe to you is that how proteosomes will lead to the disease known as cystic fibrosis. And what happens in this disease is basically there's a mutation. Now, what this means is that there's a mutation. And if you remember from the amino acid lecture, the letter F stands for phenylalanine. And then at 508, at position 508. So the phenylalanine at position 508 is going to be deleted. And this leads to a mutation in the protein that's going to be that it's trying to create, which is the cystic fibrosis transmembrane degradator. Since this protein is non-functional because it just had a mutation, it's no longer functional, ubiquitin will come over and tag this protein, which is going to take it to the proteasome and break it down. Now, how it leads to disease, because basically some experiments have found that even this mutated CFDR could function properly if it's put into the membrane. But since the proteasomes are breaking this protein down, they're kind of leading to the disease, which is known as a cystic fibrosis. Okay. Uh, okay, so I think we're done. Do you have any other question? This is basically the last concept. Uh, do you have any other question about the previous stuff before we get to the last point? About the signaling, any signaling? Um, do you mind just repeating this specific slide, please? This one, the proteasomes? Yeah. Okay, sure. So a proteasome, is basically used to break down proteins. How do we know that this protein is needed, like we need to break down this protein? It's basically gonna be tagged by a ubiquitin. A ubiquitin ligase, uh, a ligase is basically any enzyme that puts something on it, okay? So a ubiquitin ligase, it's like putting a ubiquitin on it. So once the ubiquitin ligase adds ubiquitin on this protein, what happens is that it's, okay, this protein, is used for, now we're gonna degrade this protein. And where does degradation take place? In the proteasome. And this is very important when we're talking about a disease such as cystic fibrosis. When we look at this right here, uh, as triangle F508, it basically describes a mutation. So this is a mutation of the F, which is a phenylalanine from the table of the amino acid lecture that you took. So F stands for phenylalanine and 508 is at position 508. So there's a mutation, we're deleting three nucleotides, that will lead to the deletion of the phenylalanine at the position 508. And this protein is required for creating CFDR or cystic fibrosis transmembrane regulator. 
It's basically a protein that's going to be found in the lungs, uh, basically in the lung membrane. A CFTR protein is going to be put there to like regulate the chloride and stuff. If it's non-functional, or it's basically we had this mutation, this protein is like considered to be non-functional by the cell. So the cell will tag it by ubiquitin. And if it's tagged by ubiquitin, it will be broken down. Now, how it leads to the pathophysiology of the disease, because basically, so like some experiments have showed that the CFTR protein could have, like, could be slightly functional. Of course, not as functional as a normal one, but like it could be slightly functional. But since we, the cell breaks it down, we don't have this protein anymore, it's going to lead to a disease, which is known as cystic fibrosis. Okay, thank you so much. Of yeah. Uh, so can you repeat the process? Which one, which process do you want? This one? I'm gonna go over the last slide. Uh, uh, okay, so now this last slide, basically it's a simple slide. All you need to know is highlighted. The constitutive secre there's two types of secretions, constitutive and regulated secretion. The difference between them is that constitutive secretion, constitutive, like, you know, it's constant. It's always gonna be made. The protein is made and it's gonna be released outside the cell. It's made and it's released outside the cell. The regulated secretion from its name, regulated. So the secretion only takes place when there is a regulation on it or when there is a stimulus, okay? So this is basically all you need to know from this slide. The constitutive secretion is a secretion that's constant, always taking place. The protein is made, it's released, made, and it's released. A regulated secretion, the protein is made only when there's a stimulus. And this could occur in the case, or like an example would be an insulin. So basically insulin would be only made when there is an elevation in the blood glucose, because it basically changes in the receptors and stuff. Only when there is an elevation of blood glucose, the insulin can be released outside the cell. So it's referred to as regulated secretion. And that's all for the slide. Do you have any question about the lecture, guys? Before we go to the questions. It's all clear. Uh, I have a small question. So for an example, in cystic fibrosis, and we have a mutation, then we have the uh, unbuconated uh, protein. So this protein goes to the proximons, and at the same wait, time- wait, We have what? It. We have what? Uh, the- Ubiquinated, ubiquitinated protein? Yeah, yeah, sorry, I don't know how to pronounce don't, it. Don't confuse, your, your, don't confuse yourself with the name. All you need to know is it's ubiquitin is on the protein. Ubiquitin. Like ubiquitin yeah. Like yeah. The way I remember it is like ubiquitin, you know? You're, you're, ubiquitin. Quitting. you're, you're quitting this. You want to die. So I'm quitting it. Ubiquitin. 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 Yeah, the ubiquitin protein basically takes it and uh, to the proximons and the proximons... Uh, Prote 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 proteasons. 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 Yeah. Type, uh, type, okay, and they break it down. But how do we still have cystic fibrosis? That's what I'm kind of confused. Because, okay, it's it's because of the like, mechanism of the disease. Basically, cystic fibrosis, what happens is the CFTR receptor is found in the lungs, right? Cystic fibrosis takes place in the lungs. So the CFTR mm -hmm. is responsible for like regulating the chloride as it takes it in or out, like I'm not really sure. But it's responsible for regulating the chloride on the lungs. If we don't have this receptor, we can no longer regulate the chloride. So we're gonna have mucus building up. Yes. And because of the mucus buildup, we're gonna have the disease. Yeah. So, so even if we like uh, take the protein and decard them, uh, the receptors might still not work. No, no. This protein itself is a receptor. Uh -huh. This the CFTR is a is a protein that's a receptor. It's a regulator. It's regulating chloride, pushing it in or out. I'm not sure yeah. what it does, but it's like regulating the chloride. Okay. Okay. If it does, if it fails to regulate the chloride, we're gonna have the disease. And mm -hmm. since it's not there because it's broken down by the proteasomes, it's basically failing to degrade to regulate the chloride ions. Therefore, uh, we're gonna have this disease. So even if we like degrade the uh, uh, the, the SFTR protein, we still don't have a, like a, a protein that regulates the chloride. So we're gonna still have a buildup. Mucus. Yes, it's it's the only protein that's responsible for doing this function. Like, you know, yeah. like each receptor, you know, such as like the sodium potassium ATPase, if I tell you, for example, it's responsible for taking the sodium and the potassium, right? It's regulating the sodium and potassium. Yeah. A CFTR oh, but, uh, is responsible for regulating the chloride that's found in the lungs membrane. Yeah. 
If it fails to regulate uh, the chloride, we're gonna have the disease. Okay, sorry, one last time questions. We said that the proximers, uh, proximers are like oxidative, one, oxidative the, reactions. The proxy Proxyosomes. It's for oxidative reactions. What do we mean by oxidative reactions? Like we remove uh, electrons. Oxi no, no, oxidative reactions. You know how basically like oxidative is uh, there is reduction and there's oxidation reactions. Yes. Which means we're, add we're adding hydrogen or we are removing hydrogen and uh, electrons. No, the way I remember it is basically Leo and GER, GER, GER and Leo. Leo, which is basically losing electron, it's oxidized. So an oxidative yes. reaction is removing the electrons. Leo, yes. L-E-O, losing electrons, oxidized. GER, G-E-R, gain electron is reduced. So a, if a protein gains an electron, it's reduced. If it loses the so electron, this is what the proximers do. Is a peroxisome, it doesn't regulate, it doesn't regulate reduction. It only does the oxidation process. Uh -huh. it, it, okay, let, let me just explain for you real quick. The reactive oxygen species detoxification uh, so that you understand it properly. Now, basically what the reactive oxygen species, this is not important with you guys, but just so you understand. Basically what happens is there is an O2, which is to be converted uh, by, it's gonna get uh, reduced into a superoxide, which is an O2 minus, and it's gonna get uh, reduced again into hydrogen peroxide, okay? And then it's gonna get regulated again uh, into a hydroxyl free radical. And then it's going to be converted to water. Now, these free radicals, if they're found in the cell, they're going to be harmful. So we need the peroxisomes, which is basically going to do the oxidative reactions that will detoxify this reactive oxygen species. Basically, if we have, for example, a hydrogen peroxide, it's going to be toxic. So it will go over to the peroxisomes, the oxidative enzymes in the peroxisome, will be responsible for removing the toxicity of the hydroxyl free radical, or like the hydrogen peroxide, I mean. Okay, I get it now, thank you. Okay, uh, it's not related to, one second. Uh, so yeah, it's not related to what happens in the proteasome. I think I made a mistake, like at first I was relating them together. No, it's not related. The proteasomes, just for breaking down the proteins. Peroxisomes, for oxidative reactions, that will degrade like the oxy reactive oxygen species. Clear? Yes, so yes. All of the secretions we took, are they constitutive or regulated? I'm not sure, but I know that collagen is going to be uh, constitutive. It depends, like we didn't take any specific example of any secretions so far, because all I told you is the mechanism. Like when we talked about secretions, I didn't tell you that we're secreting this specific protein. Now we just, I said that we're secreting a protein to the outside. The only specific example we took was the collagen, which is constitutive. I'm gonna go over the slides again if you have any questions. Or do you guys have any questions in general? Or do you want to go to the questions now? Um, everything is clear in my opinion. All right. Uh, so this question was brought by Dr. Abdul Jabbar. Honestly, it's a really tough question. Like, it's not with you guys because we only took it this year. So, like, just if you had time, if you could go over it, the questions you usually are really hard. So basically what happens here, I'm not gonna go over it so much. I'm just gonna explain the concept of it. What happens is basically the patient has nephrogenic diabetes insipidus. What diabetes insipidus is, basically the patient lacks a hormone known as ADH, antidiuretic hormone. Diuresis refers to urination. So an antidiuretic is preventing the urination process, okay? So if you're not, or like, yes, so antidiuretic is preventing a urination, urination process. How it does that? By reabsorbing the water in the kidney. A diabetes insipidus is a disease where this ADH is non-functional or the body cannot make ADH. It could have a central mechanism or a nephrogenic mechanism. The difference between the central and the nephrogenic is that the central where the body cannot make ADH, ADH itself or the nephrogenic is that the ADH is made, but it's not functioning in the kidney. So since the ADH is not functioning, the water is not reabsorbed in the kidney. And then the water will pass from the kidney all the way to the bladder. And when the, this water is building, in, building up in the bladder, you're gonna have the urge to urinate and then urinate. So that's why there's frequent urination. 
don't really like go to the details about it because it's not so related to the lecture, but just to understand the concept of it. Yes. Okay, so these are the practice questions for your lectures. Type the answers in chat, or if you want to unmute your mic, that's sure. A. I'm going to give you guys a minute to see what the answer is, and then we go over the question. Let's see. Okay, who, who wants to try and explain the question? Who wants to try to solve the question? Unmute your mic like, and try to solve the question. I guess fine if you get it wrong, we'll explain it after. All right, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm just gonna read it, fine. Uh, okay, so. Many proteins contain a specialized stretch of amino acids that are recognized by a protein complex called the signal recognition particle, right? So the stretch of amino acids is basically the signal that's gonna be recognized by signal recognition particle or the receptor for the signals, okay? Now, which of the following best describes the function of this complex? Again, what's the complex that we're talking about? It's the signal during the synthesis of the, or the complex, I mean, uh, the complex, which is basically the signal recognition particle. Which of the following describes the function of the signal recognition particle during the synthesis of secretory proteins? So we're basically talking about what is the function of the signal recognition particle when we're secreting proteins or the proteins that are going to be secreted. I got three A's and one guy sent me C in the DMs. Uh, do you want to explain why it's A or do you want to explain why it's C? Like for those who said A and for the one who said C? Because I think like there are different answers for this question you guys gave me. Okay, okay, I'm gonna explain it. So for those that said A, it the signal recognition particle, it anchors the ribosome to the Golgi membrane. This is wrong. Because first of all, we don't put the ribosomes on the Golgi. The ribosome is always in the endoplasmic reticulum. And that's why we call it the rough endoplasmic reticulum because there's ribosomes on its outer membrane. So the ribosomes are not put on the Golgi. Instead, the signal recognition particle will bind on this signal and takes the protein and the ribosome over to the endoplasmic reticulum membrane. So A is wrong. And the correct answer here would be C. It inter interacts with the amino terminus of the nascent polypeptide. What does amino terminus refer to? It's basically the N terminal. Amino terminus is just the N terminal. So this part is the N terminal. And we said for secreted protein, uh, I can't type because I'm on a mouse back, but you get me. So it's an N terminal. So we said for secreted proteins, the signal recognition particle binds on the N terminal, which is a series of hydrophobic amino acids and then takes this protein and the ribosome over to the endoplasmic reticulum and not the Golgi. And that's why the answer is C. Is it clear? Um, can you explain why it's not D? Why is it not D? Interacts with the glycosyl transferases 
within the endoplasmic reticulum. Because the signal recognition particle doesn't react with the glycosyl transferases that are inside the endoplasmic reticulum. What is the glycosyl transferase? From its name, what do you get out of it? Uh, sugar group that is being added to- Exactly. Um... Exactly. That, that's what a glycosyl transferase does. Now, is the signal recognition particle responsible for adding the sugar or does that occur? No. Yeah, exactly. It occurs after the protein has been pushed inside and the signal recognition particle is kicked away. Yes. But do we add the sugar? Uh, do we add the sugar after the signal turns, like after this or before it? We add the sugar after the prote protein is completely synthesized and it's ready. Uh -huh. So before want, this, let me go back to the slide. Let me go back to the slide so you guys can see what's happening. Sorry, I'm taking okay. a lot of time. Right here. Uh, it's fine. I don't want to take out of your time. Okay, so okay, see what happens. So this is the signal recognition particle complex. It mines on the end terminal of the amino acid sequence, and then it takes it over to the endoplasmic reticulum membrane. It pushes the protein inside, and then we get it pushes the protein inside, and then we get rid of this recognition particle. Once it's pushed inside, and it's already inside, right here. So the protein got pushed inside. Then we start adding the sugar on it. And then once it's, the sugar is added, it's folded and it's released. Okay, I get it now. Thank you. Of course. Okay, so. So the first question, the answer is C, interacts with amino acid terminus of the nascent polypeptide. Uh, the next question, let's throw number two first and then number three. Let's start with number two. Let me give you guys a minute. You could I'm give you guys like thirty seconds and I'm going to explain the question. Okay, so then I'm gonna start explaining. The intended final destination, there's an A. Okay, does anyone else want to answer? Okay, so the intended final destination of a new protein is within a peroxisome. So if we say a peroxisome, does this protein need to go to the endoplasmic reticulum to be synthesized or it can be synthesized in the cytoplasm completely? You guys answer. Does it need to go to the endoplasmic reticulum or not? Yes, it's done in the cytoplasm. It doesn't need to go to the endoplasmic reticulum. So, right? So, however, the peroxisomal targeting signal is not properly incorporated. So the signal that's gonna take it to the site to the peroxisome is not functioning. Therefore, the lysosome requires it to go to the endoplasmic reticulum. The mitochondria has nothing to do because there's no mitochondria signal. The nucleus, there's no nuclear signal. And the outside of the cell also requires it to go to the endoplasmic reticulum. And since none of these answers will work, the answer will be a cytosol. Because as you guys said, it's the protein is made in the cytosol and stays in the cytoplasm. Because there's no signal, it's gonna stay in the cytoplasm. Now with that said, try to solve number three. Here's an E. Um, give you guys 30 seconds and then I'm gonna go over the question else. Okay. 
All right. So the protein is intended to function in a lysosome, and it fails to receive the proper lysosomal tag. Uh, do you guys remember what was the lysosomal tag that we said is required to basically like bind on the special receptor? What was the tag that bind on the special receptor? Uh, it was the menos 6 phosphate. So the special tag was the menos 6 phosphate. So basically saying there's a deficiency in the menos 6 phosphate. Now, this enzyme, it fails to go to the lysosomes. So where will it be sent to? The peroxisome or the lysosome requires the endoplasmic reticulum pathway, right? Peroxisome requires the cytosol pathway, so it's strong. Mitochondria is the cytosol pathway. Cytosol is also the cytosolic pathway. The nucleus is the cytosolic pathway. And then the only answer that would be here is gonna be the outside the cell. Because if it fails to go to the lysosome, it will be sent outside the cell because it doesn't pass or it, pa it starts, it begins its way to the endoplasmic reticulum pathway. Okay, are these two questions clear for you guys? Uh, next question. Let me clear this one second. Okay. I think this is the last question. No, there's a question after it. Does anyone want to try to unmute their mic and like try to take us through the way they solve? Try to make it interactive for us. See how you guys go through around the questions. Like, so you can see like, what's your weakness? And like, what exactly you, you should focus on? Uh, let's see. Okay. A. C A B Okay, so I'm gonna read it now. A four month old male is evaluated for muscle weakness and poor muscle tone. Physical examination reveals hepatomegaly and jaw ulcer basically an enlarged liver. And further testing reveals the presence of heart defect. Excess glycogen is found within the cells of his muscles. So we have an excess glycogen, right? So basically the glycogen is not being broken down. A deficiency of an acid maltase enzyme is suspected. Based on this information, Glycogen accumulation has occurred in which location in the affected cell? Okay, so the main point here is the acid maltase enzyme. So acid maltase is basically like an example of a hydrolytic enzyme, which is basically going, now these hydrolytic enzymes, or like, so anything that's like breaking down this stuff is gonna be found inside the lysosomes. So we're talking about the deficiency in this enzyme. We're basically talking about a deficiency in all of the lysosomal enzymes. So the glycogen would go to the lysosomes and it can't be broken down in the lysosomes, which would basically lead the answer to BC, the lysosomes. Clear? So it's a deficiency in the lysosomal enzyme. So glycogen can't be broken down in the lysosome. So it will basically accumulate as inclusions in the, lysos in the lysosome, which is gonna be the answer. Okay. Uh, the last question is, all right. In a patient with cystic fibrosis caused by the mutation, the transmembrane conductance regulator protein falls incorrectly. The patient cells modify this abnormal protein by attaching ubiquitin molecules to it. What is the fate of this modified CFDR protein? 
Yes, the answer is A. It will be degraded by the proteasomes because any, any protein that's tagged by ubiquitin is going to be broken down by the ribosomes, uh, by the proteasomes. Okay. And this is basically the last slide of some important books that were about my question. Now, the first book, you just need it for like one or two lectures. Like, don't, don't read from the books, just open them and solve questions. Okay. So, like, this lecture, most of the, like you're gonna find like a lot of the questions are in this first book, the cell and molecular biology. And also you need to solve the integrative medical biochemistry. You probably heard that like from everyone already. The integrative medical biochemistry is really important. You need to solve it. And a lot of the questions might come from it. And then the last one is gonna be the lipid biochemistry. At the end of each chapter, it's gonna have like four or five questions. Try to go over them as you finish your lecture, like to help you see your understanding of the lecture. Uh, that would be all. Do you guys have any questions? for the lecture or anything in general? All clear? Everything is clear, thank you so much. Hey, I'm glad. Thank you guys for taking time. Uh, I'm glad you enjoyed.